Welcome to the Sunday Politics here in the West. We're with you live for the next 20 minutes. Now, Bristol voted on Thursday to have a mayor, but most people didn't turn out and the rest of the country rejected the idea. So, who would want the job? Well, quite a few people would like it, apparently, although we don't know the salary yet. The government says the mayor of Bristol will have more clout than a cabinet minister. So, here are some people interested in the role. Peter Abraham, a veteran Conservative councillor. Stephen Williams, a Lib Dem MP. Marvin Rees, a campaigner for social justice who hopes to get the Labour nomination. And the local architect, George Ferguson, who will be standing as an independent. Well, welcome to you all. Thank you. You've all got 20 seconds each to tell us why you might like the job. Peter, let's start with you. Well, as a Bristolian, I see that there's a real job to be done. This is a great city that I believe has been underperforming. It hasn't had the real leadership that's required. And the new and extra powers that I hope will come will mean this would be a very exciting four years for whoever's the mayor. Stephen. Well, I represent Bristol West in Parliament, the most diverse constituency in the south of England, enormous social contrast within that seat. And some of that troubles me. Uh, we have huge inequalities of wealth, uh, health and education, and I'd like to bridge those divides right across the city. Bristol is a great city, but we are divided, but I'd like a mayor to bring us together. And Marvin? Well, I, to confirm my interest in the role, which I definitely do want to go for, I went to my old school, City Academy, and what I wanted to do there was really send a clear signal that this is about a city fulfilling its aspiration for all those young people and for the people um, in, in wider Bristol, but a city that doesn't leave anyone behind. I think it's a city that's underperformed, it's a city that's uh, lacked leadership, a clear sense of where it wants to go, and a clear sense of what it stands for. And the mayor can play that role, and I'd like to do it. And George? Well, David, you know, I'm passionate about Bristol. I like to think I put Bristol first in anything I do. I think there's tremendous talent in this city that's wasted that would really like to contribute to the governance of Bristol. And I would like to harness that talent right across all parties and none. And I think we've got a great possibility of making Bristol one of the most significant European cities. OK. Well, 41,000 Bristolians thought it would be a good idea to have a mayor. 35,000 didn't. And the vast majority, well, they stayed at home. A mayor was supposed to give Bristol a place on the top table, but the other biggest cities in the land, Birmingham, Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield, all voted against. So London and Liverpool apart were now in the company of the likes of Torbay, Bedford and Doncaster. So can the candidates rise to the challenge and make this thing work? Here's Paul Baltrop. So Bristol went its own way, the only English city this week to say yes to having an elected mayor. The political post-mortems will examine why. Well, one, it's in the genes of Bristolians to be different. That's why we love this city. But secondly, there's a lot of attention on Bristol. Uh, the Conservatives in Westminster targeted Bristol as the one place they thought they could win. They were right in that choice. You know, I congratulate them on their strategic choices. The winning margin was just 5,000. With no council elections taking place, only a quarter of voters participated. It's absolutely phenomenal, the results, given how, how down we were feeling yesterday and the day before about trying to get the word out and thinking that it, you know, we wouldn't get enough people out. But it's a fallow year and we still got 24%, and I'm told that's pheno phenomenal, so yes. Bristol, though, won't be proud of the fact that in one ward, just 10% of voters went to the polls. However, advocates of elected mayors say things can only get better. Turnout was low, of course, in the, the local elections that took place around most of the country, and it's something that I regret. But actually, one thing that you see if you look at London uh, is that once you have a mayoralty, actually people do get engaged in the, uh, in the contest. And I hope that when the election takes place in November for the first mayor of Bristol, uh, there will be a lot of interest at the time and in the run-up uh, to that. So the race to take charge at this place is underway. And on paper, Labour might expect to be the favourites. In the last local elections held here a year ago, they got considerably more votes than either the Lib Dems or the Conservatives. But in mayoral contests across England over the past decade, there have been some notable successes for independents. 
Former policeman Ray Mallon, once nicknamed Robocop, is Middlesbrough's mayor. Another enduring independent is Tony Egginton in Mansfield, while in London's Tower Hamlets, Lutfi Rahman succeeded despite leaving the Labour Party. And in Doncaster, the success of Peter Davis, an English Democrat, gave hope to small parties. So the ballot boxes can be put away, but not for long. They'll be out again in November, when we'll all be voting for police commissioners and Bristol will choose its first elected mayor under a supplementary voting system. It'll all be rather new and different, and it could get confusing. Yeah. We haven't got Robocop standing, unfortunately, but we have got uh, some people interested here. Now, the office of mayor actually dates back to 1260, but this is the first time there'll be a billion-pound budget, which one of you might be controlling, who knows? So what would your priorities be? Stephen. Uh, the first priority, I think, of whoever becomes the mayor in November has to be the city's economy, getting more jobs and investment into the city. We're already a very successful city region. Uh, after Edinburgh and London, we are the most successful city in the United Kingdom. But we could be even more successful. We've got the new Enterprise Zone, which I was with the Chancellor when he opened last week. And that, I think, ought to be the number one priority, getting jobs and investment into that Enterprise Zone and transforming the city centre and giving people work and hope. Anyone got any thoughts about how that might happen, Marvin? Well, I think clearly one of the key bodies in the city at the moment is the Local Economic Partnership. We're going to have to work very uh, closely uh, with that body. But I'd say my, my concern is that we don't just go and jump in on, on, on issues for the city as well. There's a big piece of work to be done looking at the voter turnout around building the city, around the, the, the democratic legitimacy of the post, and bringing people together across the divides in the city. And I've spoken to a number of people about what the role is actually about, what they need from a mayor from Bristol. And actually, before they even get into specifics, most people are talking about the actual role. What role does it need to play? It needs to be a catalyst, it needs to be a leadership, it needs to be about getting the machinery of Bristol uh, working properly so that we're pulling together on all the expertise from our universities, from our community-based organisations, uh, from, from our, from our faith-based organisations, so that we are working on solutions and, for Bristol together. And would you expect someone who took that role to have experience running a big organisation? No one I've spoken to has said what Bristol lacks is experience. And if we need to buy managers in, then we'll get managers in. What Bristol needs is a clear sense of its narrative, its vision, where it wants to go, what its values are, and it needs a clear sense of leadership. Right. George. Well, I said to Greg Clark that on November the 16th... He's the minister. He's the minister, yeah. the city minister, that on November the 16th, if uh, I should be elected, I'd be beating his door down for extra resources and, and for extra powers. And he said, I'd be welcome. And uh, he has made promises, uh, the, the Prime Minister has made promises that Bristol will get better treatment as a result of us deciding to have an elected mayor. So that's the first thing. I think the other big job, and I so much actually agree with Marvin, is generating pride in this city, making people feel that they can be part of its governance. Mm. And I think being able to pass down power to the communities, exactly. to the neighbourhoods, to enable them to do what they want to do. I think that's, that's yeah. absolutely, well, we do, we, absolutely prime. Peter, I mean, we've talked about the office of mayor being around in Bristol since 1260. You haven't been around that long, but you were, I think, in the 1960s, so when you were a councillor. I mean, uh, Bristol hasn't performed, has it? It hasn't performed economically as well as it could do, and it's not as a loved organisation in the city. Now, are you part of the problem or are you part of the solution? I think you're absolutely right. I think one of the things that I would see as the first priority in there, it's got to be about jobs, it's got to be about the economy, it's got to be about getting a traffic right in public transport, but it's more. At the moment, we have that building in College Green that's called the Council House. That seems to divide. That We've changed. What people voted for was a change from a leader of the council mm. to a mayor of Bristol. Mm. Now, I see that mayor of Bristol not just representing what happens in College Green, but what happens in business, what happens in our schools, right across the board. Somebody batting for Bristol. Mm. And I see that is the real first priority. And Marvin and George have put their fingers on it because that is what you've got to get in place. Then you will start to build that infrastructure that the people require. In it's the moment, very interesting. at 24%, if I can just finish, yeah. is a demonstration on one side of uh, lack of interest in what we're doing 
and on the other side, the vote in favour of a mayor compared with the other cities, they're not been happy. Well, in Bristol, what's there was a, in Bristol. You're right. In Bristol, there was a lack of interest. In all the other cities that voted, all the other big ones, they voted no, uh, which tells us something, doesn't it, uh, uh, about Bristol? Now, it might be that uh, it was supposed to be this top table, wasn't it, with David Cameron chairing the, the committee of big mm -hmm. cities. Mm -hmm. Bristol's going to be virtually alone. Now, is that an no, opportunity no, no, no. or is that, is that no, going to be... I think that's a great opportunity. We, some of us were there when he made that announcement mm, and I think it was, a, it was a good idea. Cities can learn from each other. I mean, what's noticeable... They're not going to be there, though. Yeah, but what's noticeable, we'll have the big ports. We've got London, Liverpool and Bristol. I mean, that is Torbay. a real... And Torbay, yes. <laughs> Who, I've got lots of friends in Torbay. But, um, and, and I think that we have done ourselves an enormous service. And people of Bristol probably don't realise yet that the enormous service we've done by deciding to go down this route, it makes us special, and I do think that we will gain enormously from it in jobs, in cultural um, benefits, in community benefits. I think in every way we'll And benefit. I think, too, we, I mean, the, the, the mayor, just because they don't have mayors does not mean that we won't be working with these other cities. I think critical to Bristol's future is about us being an open city. There have been a number of uh, reports... And, well, there have been a number of reports and reviews of Bristol over the last year that have spoken about it being quite a closed place. It's... it's it's, it's not just about being local, but it's been quite parochial. I think this is quite a, quite a, a common sentiment. So we're going to have to be very proactive in working with other cities, mayor or no mayor, both in the UK and overseas. What would you do about the council tax? Who wants to increase the council tax here? Who wants to freeze it or actually reduce it? I think you've got to make sure you get value for money. I think that's what despairs a lot of Bristolians. That they feel they're paying uh, quite a large amount of council tax, but they're not quite sure what they're getting back in return for it. You know, big improvements have been made in some respects, like recycling. We have one of the best recycling rates uh, of any urban city in the country. So they can see they're getting value for money for that, but not necessarily anything else. Our cultural provision is very poor. So I think if you want to make a case for extra investment, don't look to the householder first. Look to see where we can get external investment, where we can work with the private sector, and work with central government to get more money in. Tax for people's but it's, it, this glib statement no. of value for money. It's got to be about more than that. I believe that we are doing things as a council that we shouldn't be doing. And therefore, I would like see what? hopefully a mayor... I, th I think we've got to look at all the services that we're providing and what see if we, we could... Doing? I don't think we should be employing loads of people doing administration. I think we could uh, 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 source out many of the things, legal services, the estate okay. agencies and all the land. There's a lot of money we can save mm -hmm. and therefore I would hope that any mayor's first pledge would be to keep on pegging the rate. I mean, People the... just can't afford yeah. more so we must look at how we can genuinely reduce without destroying the frontline services. Yeah. One, of the, one of the reasons I'm standing, David, is I think one could bring much more entrepreneurial approach to the running of the city. I think there are, th the, there are things that the city could actually make money with that can then contribute to the dire, you know, the things that in dire need. And I don't see that the only way is to increase council tax yeah, at all. Right. Um, okay. You know, you look at the use of but our resources. Bit, when it we, comes to, I mean, it, I mean, most of the spending uh, is, is controlled by the government anyway. We get our grants. Yeah. They, they want the t tax frozen. It's going to be a brave mayor who puts the council tax up. Absolutely. I, just think, I just think it's very dangerous to get into specifics at the moment where we don't know what the situation um, is and we, we don't know, we've got to be, be very there. aware I mean, of the, you're, you're yeah, be but we need to be aware of the context within which we're making decisions. Okay. So one of the problems of Bristol's past, and it's been, been shared with me by someone I really respect, is they describe Bristol as one of these 18th century machi machines that you find in a fairground, incredibly complex, loads of bells and whistles and little chains all over it, and it takes a lot of maintenance. The problem is the machine doesn't serve a purpose. Okay. So you have lots of experts keeping this going, but it's not going anywhere. Okay. We need to do things in context. Stick with us. With a purpose. Stick with us, because we're, we're going to move on now. Because the political parties have had a couple of days now to reflect on the local election results here in the West. The biggest contest was in Swindon, where all 57 councillors were up for election. Other elections were held in Stroud, Cheltenham and Gloucester. Charlotte Callan has been taking a look at what the results mean for the political parties. Local Conservatives were expecting to make losses, and they were right to. The mid-term blues cost them seats everywhere, although they did manage to hold on to a majority in Swindon by just one vote. For some, it was an unfamiliar feeling. In recent years, they'd snatched numerous parliamentary seats from Labour and increased their hold in local government. 
The worry for them now is whether the economic climate will cast a long shadow over future elections. These former Labour MPs who suffered at the hands of those Tory gains in 2010 were out gunning for the Conservative seats. The seven they won back on the council in Swindon show some voters are returning to them. But in terms of numbers, they've still got a long way to go to clinch victory in three years' time. And it was the Liberal Democrats who surprised many. Against a national backdrop of big losses, they held on to control in Cheltenham. Labour had hoped to make gains from them in Swindon too, but were left disappointed. These results will help calm their nerves as commentators warn of a general election wipeout in 2015. Certainly a, a late night. Well, time now to take a quick spin through the other political stories making the headlines this week in our 60-second roundup. <laughs> Bristol City Council's dropped its defence to a legal challenge about the future of land at Ashton Vale, where Bristol City Football Club wants to build its new stadium. Town Green campaigners say they're still thinking about what to do next. National Grid says it's hopeful parts of a new power line through North Somerset can be laid underground. The original plans involve running 37 miles of overhead cables from Hinkley Point to Avonmouth. The Tory MP in North Somerset, Liam Fox, was one of the main campaigners against the pylons. Somerset Conservatives have chosen who will be the next leader of the County Council. John Osman will take charge in two weeks' time when Ken Maddock stands down. He'll be elected as leader of the council next week. More than 150 street party applications have been submitted to Bristol City Council for the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. Bristol has seen one of the highest number of applications in the country for street parties. What a week it's been. Now, our guests are still here. Imagine you're in the Oval Office, which is uh, at the Council House, and you're in charge, <laughs> and you've got this very difficult decision we've heard about this stadium uh, still going through this week. Now, what would you do with the Bristol City Stadium application? Who's the... Well, I'm... I'll... <laughs> Science. I, George, I, I you shall start. controversially <laughs> kick off. Yeah. Uh, the first thing I'd do is go and see the chairman and MD of, of Bristol City and, and work out a way of, of taking it forward. We've got to have a stadium. You want it. We've got to have a stadium. And you'd force it through. You'd use by, all the power by some of your to force means it or another. Okay. And I'm not necessarily saying it has to go on that site. That may be a headbanger. Ah. But I do believe there is there are other ways of producing a stadium okay. if it can't go ahead. Marvin, like that. I think we need to press ahead. I, I, I think we're, we want to be a world class city. We are a world class city in, in our potential, and we need world class facilities. We need things that definitely put us on the map. Clearly, there are relationships to be managed. There are people involved here, and we want so, to do business in yes. a way that doesn't steamroll a local life. But yes, we but need to press ahead. But you would steamroll it. Steamroller is not the word I, I say. We no, don't steamroll it, but no. we work with people. But you make sure we don't steamroll it. Okay. We work with Peter? people. But we press I've ahead. been part of the Oval Office this week on this decision. Yeah. And what we've done is we've cut our uh, uh, situation when we didn't go forward with the inquiry, and so now we hope to have a new inquiry which will accelerate the process. I mustn't comment on whether I genuinely support or they, what I do want and believe that be the compromise that yeah. we came forward of half being uh, tan green, the other half being available for development was a fair and reasonable one, and I'm prepared to argue that. Okay. And Stephen, if you're in that office and you've got well, to decide... Well, the first thing, of course, is that the mayor actually won't decide it. There'll well, still be a city council. It's actually up to the planning committee and the, and the rights of way committee and all those people to decide yeah. it, not, not the mayor. So but the mayor would have to have a, a vision. I think what the mayor must have is a clear vision that Bristol does deserve those world-class facilities, whether it's for cricket, football, yeah. rugby, and so on. That's what part of being a great city is. And sometimes we have to make messy compromises with citizens in order to get that. Okay. All right, Can well, I say have... a last word? If we'd had a mayor before, I don't think we'd be in this position now, because that mayor would have knocked heads together. It was appalling okay. at the beginning of the, the process. The whole thing has been a dire mess, Peter. That's and, right. And I, I think agree. 
we should recognise there's been a lot of wasted um, money and resources. And if we do have a last word, mm. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's, I think it's actually very important, as we spoke about at the beginning, okay. the role of the mayor isn't just economics, it's about bringing the city right. together so it makes decisions and okay. pushes ahead Absolutely. together. Can I have the last word, please? Because that's all we've got time for this week. The Sunday Politics Show continues with Andrew in London. If you want to watch the programme again, then you're welcome to. It's on the iPlayer, but for now, enjoy the rest of the bank holiday weekend. And here is Andrew.